questions later. Uh, now I have the pleasure of inviting uh, our dear friend Kanakmani Dekshi, who will speak on Nepal, gateway into and out of South Asia. With the permission of the chair, I think I should stand and
underlying anything that I, everything that I'm going to present right now is, of course, the idea that progress through use of new infrastructure and uh, evolved geopolitics should always be for the economic growth and for social justice for the largest number of people. And when we speak of the largest number of people, we have to think of the largest concentration of population anywhere in the world. Some of this is in China and some of this is in the Indo-Gangetic Plains, in particular the central Ganga Maidan. How can what is about what may happen in the Himalayan frontier benefit particularly the landlocked Bihar and Uttar Pradesh? We tend to think in Nepal, and Nepal is being landlocked, but there are other larger regions in terms of population that are also landlocked. So, when I speak of Nepal or the central Himalaya, the interest will not be so much, in my view, and in my own presentation, so much for the benefit of the people of the Himalayan Delt, because I go by numbers of people who might benefit. Can it benefit the Gangetic Plains? Not the Brahmaputra, not the Indus for now, just to think about the Ganga Vaita. Let's now focus on the central Himalayan region in terms of geography and in terms of history. To be able to make my, to go deeper into the idea of how will the railway be a game changer. Geographically, the Himalaya is 2500 kilometers long. It is in a, it is sort of a wide plateau towards the Karakoram and beyond that the Hindu Kush. It tapers to a slim mountain range, the highest but the slimmest in the Nepal Himalaya, and it becomes lower and remaining slim uh, towards Bhutan and towards the northeast. Our vision of the Himalaya as this forbidding and distant land that is out of reach and cannot be breached has several things, uh, several things have created this region in our mind, whereas the Himalaya is actually very, very permeable, especially now in times of infrastructural development, everything from transmission lines to highways and railways. So why do we have this vision of the Himalaya, and in this particular instance, the central Himalaya, as inaccessible, as an arena that actually uh, cannot in any way be breached to bring us any kind of economic, infrastructural connectivity. So we have grown up reading the great European adventurers, the Himalayan climbers and Himalayan adventurers. So immediately since childhood, we are brought up with visions of loftiness and inaccessibility. That is the psychological state in which we begin considering the Himalayan. Because it is in the interest of the adventurers to talk about how difficult it is and how isolated it is and how rugged it is. Then you've got the fact that the 1962 war between India and China created a horror psychosis, especially among the geostrategic wallahs of India. So the Himalaya was a strategic no-go, no-no frontier. So if anything, you built highways for strategic uh, connectivity, but not for economic connectivity. To the extent that in the 70s and 80s and up to the early 90s, when Nepal wanted to build north-south highways, there was always uh, a, a dissatisfaction, if not uh, deliberate blockage from the side of the Indian state. The historical knowledge is also lacking. The fact that Nepal has always had economic linkages with Tibet much more than it had with the Indo-Gangetic Plains. This will come as a surprise to many. And by Nepal for now, we of course mean the Nepal Valley, i.e. Kathmandu Valley, which is the cauldron of the Nepali state. Kathmandu Valley had extraterritoriality on occasion for decades on end uh, over Tibet. Not only that, uh, some of the riches of Kathmandu Valley are, uh, are said to rely on trade with Tibet. There was a lot of cultural assimilation and connectivity with the South. Since the Lichavi times, Vaishali, since the Malla period, right down to the present. But until the Brit 
British incursions into the South Asian hinterland through the East India Company, the economy of Kathmandu Valley was actually turned northward, not to the south. The pivot happened with the increasing uh, inroads. As long as nobody is hurt. Okay. So the knowing a little bit of history will also be helpful. And in that, the links to the north were always there since historical time, till about the time that uh, uh, the East India Company made in road, in which Nepal's economy turned, Kathmandu Valley's economy turned southward. Also the fact that the mainland was very far away, meaning the Chinese mainland. Tibet, as you know, on occasion was independent, on occasion was a Chinese suzerain. But the mainland was so far away that it didn't actually make a difference whether the Himalaya was permeable or not, because the economy of Tibet itself was rather small. So that is where I now bring in the railroad as the one infrastructural advance that may make a difference not only for Nepal and the inhabitants of this great larger central Himalayan region, but possibly for the, the central Gangetic Plains. Why, before I get there, why a sudden, this sudden interest on the northern rimland? Partly because of the railway that I mentioned, and that will be how I will end my presentation, talking about the, the King High Tibet Railroad. But the two things, two additional points that has made us look northward. One of them is the Indian blockade of Nepal of 2015. Five months long and a very, very Indian blockade, economic blockade for imposed in dissatisfaction of the constitution adopted by the Constituent Assembly of Nepal. No need to get further than that on that particular topic. But what it did was it created, particularly in the hills of Nepal, such an angst and anger towards the southern neighbor that it provided political energy to the Nepali leadership to reach out to the north. Something that they would never have had the courage or the way we call to do politically. So essentially it was the great blockade as I call it, the great blockade of 2015 that made Nepal once again pivot this time back northward. Now it is easier said than done of course because the Nepal is extremely connected culturally and economically to the Gangetic Plains and to the nation state that is India. But suddenly it was possible to visualize third country transit through the north, even though Guangzhou is 3,000 kilometers away and Calcutta is only 1,000 kilometers away. But in case of an emergency, such as the 1989 blockade or the 2015, you could actually consider an alternative possibility. More than that, the infrastructural uh, advances that India was, uh, the China was making on the Tibetan plateau, suddenly it seemed possible for Nepal to access or to be linked to that infrastructure because the politicians gained the energy or the guts to do something that they would not otherwise have. It required a blockade for them to be able to generate that kind of energy. So to that extent one may thank New Delhi that Nepal is suddenly opening up to the north towards China. Now the ball is in the Nepali court now. How do you countenance China? That is the next, next challenge. I will not get into that for now. The other uh, element that came in, one was the blockade, the other is the arrival of the railway. But linked to the railway, it was suddenly uh, the announcement of Lee, uh, Sin Bing, the Chinese president of the Belt and Road Initiative or the OBOR Initiative. Because suddenly that plows in so much funds for infrastructural development and what Nepal needs are funds relatively minuscule in scale in terms of what the Chinese are doing around the globe and in the CPEC in Pakistan. Nevertheless, the infrastructure linkage that Nepal needs and that China is able to uh, rush along at quite a, quite a clip actually. Look at how the railway arrived. Uh, in 
2003, I believe it was, it arrived in, 2002, it arrived in Lhasa. 2015, it arrived in Shigatse. And 2020, it arrived 120 kilometers north of Kathmandu Valley. And the Chinese have expressed interest in extending the railway into Kathmandu Valley and to Lumbini. These are things to be discussed and negotiated and thought over for the future. But for now, it is clear that the railway will arrive very close to Kathmandu in the year 2020. And the way the Chinese do their, job, do their work, it will happen. So what are the possibilities of this railroad, railroad for the Gangetic Plains beyond Nepal and the central Himalaya? If you look at the map, you've got Gwadar to your left, and you got Chiribong to the right. Gwadar, while strategically and economically important for China as a whole, essentially linked, links Gwadar to Kashgar, or Pakistan to Xinjiang. Chiribong, on the other hand, will link itself uh, to Kunming. And both of these corridors will be primarily of interest for the Chinese to reach the Bay of Bengal or the Persian Gulf. Whether one takes it as a strategic danger or an economic opportunity, what the train line coming to Tibet does is, it, it is aimed straight at the Gangetic Plains. Which means that if there were to be economic activity, then it should be and can be beneficial both ways. I should explain to you perhaps the possibilities of the train. Because everything now is going to depend on whether transport of goods by train is a viable economic activity in this day and age. And I'm not an economist nor an infrastructure person to answer to this, to give you an answer to this myself. But we lay out, let me lay out the scenario before you. Because much of what I'm suggesting in relation to what may happen will essentially uh, depend upon how viable is the railroad of uh, coming up through Tibet in terms of goods transfer and tra passenger transfer? Uh, I'll only mention that the Chinese are extremely interested in Lumini as the one uh, holy spot in the five or six uh, locales important to the world of the historical Buddha, only one that is outside of present day India. So there is also a great interest in developing passenger traffic for Buddhists, uh, Buddhists from China. And the Chinese state seems to be more amenable to the growth of Buddhism than any of the other religions. Leaving that aside and looking purely at goods transport, it seems that the way the Chinese are linking their economy, especially the inland cities, because in the last 10 years, China has itself pivoted to move its infrastructure and, uh, and uh, industrial base to the inland city. And they are now trying to link to Europe. So there are 11 cities in Europe presently connected with Chinese cities. I can just give you a list of the, the kind of cities that are linked. There is, uh, Suzhou is linked to Warsaw. Some of these are three day trains, some of these three, 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 three days a week trains, some of them are four days a week. Liangzhou with Rotterdam, Chengdu with Lodz, Chongqing with Duisburg, and on and on, 11 cities are presently linked directly by train. And they take about two weeks for now, and they could be brought down, it is said that they will be brought down to 10 days. Which means that except for very heavy cargo, but low, low value cargo which still goes by ship, and high, extremely high value <coughs> cargo that continues to go by aircraft, the Chinese seem to have Unless somebody is making a major boo-boo somewhere, a major strategic and economic mistake somewhere, the Chinese seem to have found economic viability in the revival of rail in trans-Asian uh, linkages to Europe. So if that is working, then why should not a much shorter distance to South Asia work? So this is the way I, see, I feel that unless uh, it is true that uh, the Chinese president is setting a, his entire career, he's putting it, 
uh, in thoda sa joking, some danger in putting all his eggs in the overboard basket. And in that he's relying on railroads much more than the ships. So I will now come towards the end of my presentation to suggest to you that it seems that railroad for the transfer of goods is a viable project unless something goes really wrong in the Chinese planning. In which case the railroad does arrive very close to the South Asian uh, plains. The Himalaya is a narrow sliver as I said earlier especially in the Nepal section. It may be 2500 miles long and in large parts it may be two to 300 miles wide. But the actual high Himalaya, if you do not count the lower Himalaya known in Nepal as the Mahabharat range and if you don't count the, the Shivalik or Chure as it is known in Nepal, the actual high Himalaya stretch is no more than 30 to 40 miles wide. So if we rejig out thinking of the Himalaya and if we also, in terms of geography, to know that it is a very thin sliver, not much of an uh, infrastructural feat anymore uh, to build a highway or a railway across, barring major earthquakes. Then if we also think about the viability, possible viability of the railroad in terms of carriage of goods, and if we consider that Nepal's position in South Asia uh, has changed drastically or its positioning in South Asia has changed drastically in the last three years in terms of it being open to the northern connectivity and given that Nepal is a country that is 500 miles wide and 80 miles to 85 miles, 500 miles long and 80 to 85 miles wide and within that the Himalayan section is rather thinner than that, then the possibility arises what can we do to take advantage of this in terms of economic growth and social justice, not just for Nepal, but for the people of the Ganges Plains, let's say three to 350 to 400 million people in the plains, given that China itself is an economic powerhouse and a producer of goods, let's not talk about services for now, how much of, benefit, of that benefit can accrue to the people of the northern half of South Asia? As well as, can we look forward to the day when there will be a reverse flow? There is, if you look at uh, Europe, the Chinese are exporting mostly, but they are also importing from Europe. Um, in much smaller quantities, but they are importing wine and cheese while they are exporting high, highly sophisticated industrial products. Uh, but within, between India in particular, or South Asia as a whole, and China, there may be the possibility that this connectivity will bring us quite a lot of advantage as long as we are careful about it. And uh, the countries of Southeast Asia and South Asia do seem to be amenable to the idea of connectivity. In fact, connectivity as I know it is a term propagated by Shyam Sharan. It's just that it seems to have been hijacked by India, by China. That uh, it is propagated by Shyam Charan as Foreign Secretary of <coughs> India uh, 15 years ago. But then now India seems to be silent in the C word, but the Chinese seem to be using it in their state visits and their official pronouncement. But nevertheless, psychologically, the intention is there as seen in four acronyms. The one acronym BINSTEC, the other acronym BCIM, and the other BBIN. These are all about connecting Bangladesh, Myanmar, in one case, in the case of BCI and Yunnan, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, and India, and the northeast of India in particular, which is probably where this presentation fits within the overall rubric of the lecture series because one has to say something about northeast India to make it part of this uh, lecture series, I guess. So, in the end, I speak not only about the Qinghai Railway as a, a possible game changer for Nepal, but much more in, importantly, a possible game changer for the northern half of India. Uh, and I'll leave it there uh, and 
If there are any questions, certainly we'll take them during the question and answer. Thank you. So friends, uh, we had uh, two very thoughtful lectures. Professor Abbasaji's lecture is probably more decisive in his judgment of uh, what is going to, perhaps what is going to happen in Pakistan uh, because of the uh, economic corridor. We also had uh, the second lecture, which was uh, probably less judgmental and uh, more open to the, the possibilities uh, of uh, the new initiatives. Now, uh, Professor Agbazaj's lecture before I open it, you know, something that came to my mind because he ended his lecture with uh, reminding us of what was happening 100 or 200 years ago. Uh, something that uh, it's just for you to think, not today, but you know, in the days later, that infrastructures by and large would, uh, uh, I think, do always have some kind of imperial uh, uh, tones to them. Uh, there are fascinating accounts that how from the late 1850s uh, the construction of railway lines and telegraph poles, how they were extremely crucial for imperial expansion. But on the other hand, it's also true that the construction of uh, you know telegraph poles and uh, precisely with the help of the railway lines. Uh, we had uh, a kind of uh, change of economies around the world which exceeded uh, the, the imperial motives uh, that were certainly there, behind them. Now, one question will be that today's uh, the initiative to, you know, uh, construct roads, uh, build up much more importantly digital infrastructures, uh, then certainly cable, much of the, and Professor Abrazadi referred to that, that much of the uh, infrastructure building will be also around the cables. Now, these will have, will have again, uh, definitely financial uh, dimensions to them, but on the other hand, they will also leave certain things that probably we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot, you know, properly forecast today as to what is going to happen. So all I am saying is that in infrastructure building, it is difficult to forecast, partly because as you uh, heard Professor Zaidi, that uh, when one speaks of the economic corridor, it's not simply the road. One reason, I do not know probably Professor Zaidi will be able to tell you, one reason why there is so little news and it is so difficult to say what will actually happen is because it's not simply a project, but it's a complex of several things. There are industrial units, there are smart cities, there is a road, uh, there will be a, a development of mobile telephony and many other things. So it's difficult to say because we are not here uh, forecasting or prospecting one particular uh, you know, undertaking, but it's a complex of several things. And therefore, uh, maybe that the way we look at it, mm, uh, it may be the case that uh, you know, we are still not familiar with the, with the new way in which the infrastructure building will be going on. This was true of railway lines also, laying down railway. This was true of uh, setting up telegraph poles also. But my own understanding is that the nature of the imperial infrastructure of 1850s, 60s and 70s and the uh, nature of infrastructure today, uh, they might have you know, different organic uh, properties. But I leave you, you know, with these questions. Now, this is open for discussion. We have about half an hour of discussion. So please raise your questions, but at the same time identify, you know, yourself kindly and please tell the person with the two of the panelists if it is a question both to both of them 
then uh, fair enough. Uh, but it's Ah, no.